This video is one in a multi-part series on designing the control circuit for a serial adder. In the previous video, we identified the algorithm that the circuit must follow and condensed it into both table and flowchart form. In this video, we will put the rubber to the road and identify devices that can accomplish the various steps of the algorithm. We will ultimately end up with this rather large circuit. I strongly encourage you to print out the next day table and the flowchart to have with you as you watch the video. I also encourage you to not expect to understand all the components at once. This is not the kind of lesson you can watch through just once. You need to get your hands dirty. Watch this video. Try building the circuit yourself. Refer back to the video for clarifications. Add more to your circuit, and so on. Here's the format for each of the slides we will look at. The complete circuit is shown small up top. The individual component being discussed is highlighted on the full circuit and enlarged down below so we can see it. Note that the order I show these components is arbitrary. All the pieces fit together, so I really can't say, in step one, you must do this. The first component I'll show is the data path. This is the same serial adder we have focused on the past few lessons, just condensed into a device symbol. We can see the serial data input, the control inputs, and the outputs for the final sum. Note how small this data path is compared to the overall circuit. This is partly a result of not having status signals available, which makes the control circuit more complicated. The second component is the start switch. This is the only external signal for our machine. Notice that the switch feeds into an AND gate, which makes the switch meaningful only if in idle mode, when Q1 and Q0 are both low. This was identified in the next state table, where start is a don't care condition, except in idle mode. Also note that there is a start and start prime signal. This is simply because some of the other devices in the circuit are active low and others active high. This allows us to feed the appropriate signal to the appropriate port. The third component is the input data. As discussed previously, we want to clock the eight input bits into a register once start is activated, so that the data is held constant throughout the addition process. Here, we see that register. Because there is no enable port, we connect the start signal to the positive edge clock port. When start jumps zero to one is the only time the values are loaded into the register. On the other end of the data path is the output data. Again, we are using a register that must clock in data at the proper time. We'll see the logic of variable max2 soon. Max2 will be high during the last clock cycle of the add phase. On the next clock cycle, it drops high to low. This not gate flips that to low to high, which means a positive edge triggers this register at the moment the addition is complete, just like we wanted. Also, I decided to clear this register at the start of a new addition. That doesn't hurt, but wouldn't actually be necessary. Why use ground on D5 through D7? Because the completed sum is just 5 bits, even though we have an 8-bit register. Only D0 through D4 will be meaningful, and these leading bits are all forced to zeros. Now we hop up to the main control region. The heart of any sequential circuit is its memory, so I'll start there. The sequence of states needs to follow what is shown in the table. 0, 0 for idle, 0, 1 for load, 1, 0 for add. 2 bits means 2 flip-flops. Any type of flip-flop could work. I found JK to be simplest. Let's look at the state changes. When in idle mode, 0, 0, it should change to load, 0, 1, when the start signal is activated. And a high signal here causes that change. When in load mode, 0, 1, it should change to add, 1, 0, after the load phase is complete. 
As we'll see soon, the variable max1 indicates this point. Therefore, it resets the rightmost bit and sets the leftmost bit. When in add mode, 1, 0, it should change to idle, 0, 0, after the add phase is complete. Similar to max1, the variable max2 identifies this point from the counter, and so it is used to reset the leftmost flip-flop. Note that this little R signal here would not be used in normal operation. We only need it upon powering up the circuit to provide initial values to the flip-flops. The sixth component is the counter, which is used to keep track of how long the circuit has been in each mode. This is the big addition we must have in the control circuit because the data path does not have a status signal telling us when it is done adding. As identified in the next state table, this counter will reset back to all zeros at two points, after the idle phase and the load phase. At these points only, the reset count signal drops low, which loads in all those zeros through this ground signal. The ground signal also tells the counter never to clear asynchronously and to always be enabled. This plus five volt signal tells the counter to always count up rather than down. Lastly, due to an unfortunate quirk in LogicWorks where the JK flip-flops behave as if they are negative edge triggered, a clock prime signal is used here to keep the counter synchronized with the rest of the circuit. Now for the last component, which ties up some of the loose ends. This decoder device and downstream logic gates are used to determine important signals discussed earlier. Max1, Max2, and reset count. The inputs to the decoder are just the counter outputs. So, if the count is at 7, output line Q7 is high, and all the others are low. According to the table, this is important only if the circuit is in load mode with state code 01. This AND gate outputs high only in that special case. Therefore, it identifies the final clock cycle of the load mode. Very similarly, the end of add mode occurs when the count reaches 3 and the state code is 1, 0. This AND gate identifies that special case and outputs max 2. As discussed a minute ago, the counter should reset at the end of idle mode, identified by the start signal, or at the end of load mode identified by max1. I said OR, so why use a NOR gate? Because the counter port is active low. And that's how you add 9 plus 4. Piece of cake, right? I mean that as a joke, because it is not so simple. It will take some time for all of this to sink in. Build this circuit for yourself, or a similar one that I assign you. Slowly but surely, the pieces will start to fit together. To help with that, I've made another video demonstrating the circuit in action. Be sure to watch it. Throughout this whole discovery process, keep in mind that this design would have been nearly impossible without the guiding framework of the data path control model.